uh, I'm going to call everything to order. It's 5.31 p.m. Right on June, right at 5 June 22nd, 2021. This is the uh, Monroe County Council work session for the month of June. And I will do a quick roll call of all of our council members present here this evening. So please unmute your microphones and indicate by voice that you're present when I call your name. Council Member Decker. Here. Council Member Hawk. Council Member Iverson. Here. Council Member McKim. Here. Council Member Munson. And Council Member Wilkes. Here. Okay, so we have five of the seven here. We have a quorum and we'll move forward with our agenda. Uh, next up will be adoption of the agenda. Do we have any members who uh, have any edits or modifications, changes? to the agenda that we're going to be considering tonight. This agenda is posted to the Monroe County Government webpage. Uh, so if anybody has, uh, to, the, to the website rather. So if anybody has any, uh, uh, would like to see that, you can visit the, uh, the county government website and see what we're working off of tonight. Do we have anybody with changes to our agenda? Okay, and I, for once, do not have one either. So this is all good. We'll take a motion, I guess, to adopt. Move we adopt the agenda. All right, any questions or comments? We have any public comment on the motion Second. to adopt the agenda? Seeing none, we will do a roll call vote, please. On the motion to adopt the agenda, Councilor McKim? Yes. Councillor Wilt? Yes. Uh, Councillor Iverson? Yes. Councillor Deckard? Yes. Councillor Spoonmore? Yes. Motion passed. Motion passed. Okay, so make a, make a note that uh, Councillor Hawk has entered the meeting. Okay. So yeah, just for the record, uh, Council Member Hawk did uh, join the meeting after the motion had been made, but it appears, are you, are you wanting to cast a yes vote on the motion? Correct. To adopt it? Okay, so we can record her vote as yes. So noted. Okay, very good. So the agenda has been adopted. We'll now move forward with item number three and that's department updates. Do we have any departments here present who would like to make an update? It looks like uh, Ms. Purdy has joined us. Welcome, Ms. Purdy. Yes, yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, the update I would like to share with um, the council and actually with the public is that the criminal justice review reports have been released and they are available on the county website. So I just wanted to bring that to everyone's attention and I believe those reports have been shared with you guys also. So. Do you know the, uh, the exact location on the website for those? Is it on the homepage? Should be on the homepage. I okay. have not confirmed Great. that, but that's where it should it's be. There. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have any questions for Ms. Purdy while she's here with us? Okay. Thank you for that important information. We'll look forward to the to the big uh, meeting tomorrow night too. Thank you, uh, Ms. Hawk. Yes. Yes. Would that have been an appropriate time to ask a question about the meeting for tomorrow night? Sure. Or is she already gone? Uh, will the courts and yeah. um, the sheriff's department be in attendance? I cannot cannot say unequivocally, um, but I believe that they will be. I know that the sheriff is out of town, actually, right. but um, I think that he may try to um, be present. Thank you. You're welcome. And they've certainly all been invited, correct? Yes, yeah. definitely. Mm -hmm. Okay, any further questions regarding the meeting tomorrow? Okay, well, thank you, Ms. Purdy. We appreciate it. We'll see you soon. Have any other departments with updates? And uh, I believe Ms. Caudill had joined, but she may be having some trouble with the microphone. Is that right? Hmm. 
see if we might be able to work that out. She's back. Ms. Cottle, are you with us? Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, yes, I'm back. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Thanks for joining uh, us. Uh, yeah, I, I don't have um, a lot in terms of an update, just uh, we are making progress in terms of vaccinations. We have over 54% of our eligible population is fully vaccinated and over 53% of our have received a first dose. Um, slow and steady progress is what we are making. Um, and um, it, we have lots of opportunities for vaccination still as they will kind of transition from these mass clinics, they will start to be more points of care. So I would take the opportunity while we have IU Assembly Hall open as a mass site to, it's easy, you can make an appointment using ourshot.in.gov uh, or you can just show up and walk in and they will take you. Uh, we've started what we're calling Moderna Mondays at our Miller Drive at the Public Health Clinic, and you can make an appointment online for that as well. We continue to do homebound and look at other outreach that we can do. We will be at Mother Hubbard's Cupboard on July 1st. Uh, we will be there from 12 to 2 and 4 to 6 is the plan. And the Indiana Department of Health has purchased during this pandemic several mobile units that are assigned by district and they will be in Harrodsburg at the community center from June 23rd to the 25th from nine to six each day. And they will have both Johnson and Johnson and Pfizer vaccines. So lots of opportunities to be vaccinated. And I would just say, get that vaccine or help somebody who's not received it uh, to, to get there and get that appointment and get vaccinated so that we can reach that 60 to 70% vaccination rate. Excellent, thank you for that information. Do we have anyone uh, that would like to ask questions for Ms. Collier? Yes, uh, Mr. Iverson. Yeah, um, do we have updated numbers on the percentage of positive cases that are un unvaccinated in, in the county? Um, well, certainly, even as a state, it's like not, it's over 99, 93% is of all of our cases. I don't have that right in front of me. I can double check it. Maybe when I come back, I can give you that updated number. But it is a very small percentage that are breakthrough cases where people have been fully vaccinated. And certainly we see mostly the, I think they're calling it now the alpha variant B17, you know, 117, but we're, we're seeing Delta variant here as well. And it is expected, you know, to become the dominant strain. Our vaccines are good against these variants right now. So it's our opportunity to get ahead of them and uh, slow the spread of the variants and the virus. Yeah, Delta's here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Any further questions or comments? Okay. Well, thank you for the update, Ms. Cottle. And we look forward to uh, hearing from you again soon. Any other department updates this evening for the council? All right. It doesn't appear so. So we'll wrap up item number three and move on now to our next item on the agenda, number four. And these are a couple of requests uh, for midpoint hires. And I think we'll start with uh, Youth Services Bureau. Council, I move to approve the Youth Services Bureau's request for a midpoint <laughs> hire of the financial and personnel coordinator position in fund 1114-0166 lit special purpose and to simultaneously amend the 2021 salary ordinance account line 11170 financial and personnel coordinator 40 hours pat three exempt to a midpoint higher status second all right we have a motion a second i see mr malone with the youth services bureau has joined us welcome sir 
Thank you for having me again. Um, I was here a little bit earlier this uh, this month to discuss this position. Unfortunately, that person was then offered the position, and I believe uh, Vicky was discussing with me that was able to parlay that into a raise at her current place of employment, and um, was then uh, not in, and then decided not to to take the position. So we have a new an, uh, another candidate who is um, exceptionally well qualified, and Vicky. Um, did ask me to come talk to her about, with, with you about that today. Um, also, because of you know the nature of what occurred, I believe she may have been aware of the, 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 the potential for midpoint higher, and so she was inquiring about that. So we're here. Um, we have a great hire. She's actually coming out of the um, out of the. Uh, sorry, she's she's coming out of a local company. So she um, has a extensive experience managing a variety of budgets. And um, we are hoping that, that you will look at her resume and think she is uh, suitable for midpoint hire. Got it, thank you. Um, let's uh, check now and see if we have any questions or uh, comments regarding this request. Any council members who would like to get started? Uh, I saw Ms. McKim's hand first and then Ms. Wiltz. Actually, I'll, I'll yield to Ms. Wiltz first. Okay. Um, my question is um, just having looked at the resume, I didn't see this and I was wondering if maybe I missed it. Does this candidate have any experience in government or nonprofit arenas at all? Virtually all of her experience has been in the private sector. Um, working, but she has working with um, doctors and a few other corporations. Um, so she has more management experience than we've had in the past is with the previous candidates, but not so much in the uh, pu in the public sector. Okay, thanks, uh, Ms. Kim. So I, I yeah, I, I was going to just kind of address the the same kind of issue, and and I agree that this one's maybe more of a. Uh, a border case with respect to our policy than than some of the others where they're they're the other or their previous employers were much more clearly identical or similar government units. I, I when I when I look through it, the um, IU Health experience seemed closest to. I mean that that that's nonprofit. I mean that that is a non, in the nonprofit sector. Uh, four years of. Uh, of experience with uh, in doing similar functions for IU Health, so I I thought that was enough to get me over the hump. But you know, like I said, this this one was is a little more border case than than some of the others. I don't know what everybody else feels. Uh, Mr. Iverson, yes. In, in reviewing the, the job description and, you know, for the financial and personnel coordinator, it seems like a lot of the duties in the individual um, areas on her on this person's resume seem to be uh, of great benefit to the county. And it seems like something that I could support. Mr. Decker. Thank you very much. In examining the documents and seeing the number of years in medical uh, medical billing, medical processes, and, and all the bureaucracy and change that happens with that. I suspect that the county gives it a good shot at being having processes that are similar. And I'm, I'm being kind because we initiate some of those. But I, I would think that there is some comparability to that as well. It also sounds as if um, the, the, the need of this job and the competitiveness in this current market is going to mean that we're going to have situations like this as we try to get the right person for some of these roles. Thank you. Okay, uh, Ms. Hawk. Uh, could you remind me, is this an exempt position? This is exempt, yes. I apologize, my space bar wasn't working for me. Um, yeah, I believe it is exempt, yes. 40 hours, Pat, three. Mm -hmm. exempt. Was that all, Ms. Hawk? Yes, I just want, I'm going to start looking at uh, overtime and what's happening in all the overtime budgets. I had a, a great reminder 
uh, something that was in the press recently in another area, but it's something that I'll, I'll be asking these questions. Thank you. Thank you. So I, I too think I can support this. It was, I agree with Ms. McKim and I think Ms. Wiltz's uh, question was very, uh, uh, was very relevant. Um, uh, and the, the IU health experience was uh, kind of got me over the, the, the hump there as well too. Uh, but I, I, I think we, as we consider more of these going forward, it's gonna be important that we're really, you know, applying that resolution um, that uh, as we make these decisions, but uh, hopefully uh, you won't have to come back for round three on this one if this uh, passes tonight. So uh, I will, uh, I'll support it. Well, and I, I think if I can say, she's already started as why the pr other person was hoping that it would happen and then doing what people do, uh, I would say. Um, she's already started, she's already working with, uh, in, and, and she was with us to work on stats and budget today. So, um, so she's, she's great. We, we are hoping that, that this can pass because, um, you know, Vicki Vicky spoke with her and, and we really think we're, she's in a great position to, to deserve it. So thank you for your consideration. Mm -hmm. Yeah, any further questions or comments? Is there any public comment? All right, we'll have a roll call vote, please. On the motion to approve a midpoint hire and to amend the 2021 salary ordinance in fund 1114-0166. Councilor Spoonmore? Yes. Councilor Hawk? Yes. Councilor Wilt? Yes. Councilor McKim? Yes. She's not here. Councilor Duck Deckard? Yes. Councilor Iverson? Yes. Motion passed six to zero. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Malone. Thank and you very next, much. Next up is item 4B, our surveyor's office with a uh, another, we have another midpoint hire request here. Council, I move to approve the surveyor's request for a midpoint hire of the survey technician in fund 1000-0006 general fund surveyor, 50% split and fund 1202-0000 coroner perpetuation. 50% corner perpetuation, 50% split, and to simultaneously amend the 2021 salary ordinance account line 12009 survey technician 35 hours, Pat one, non exempt to a midpoint higher status. Second. All right, we have a motion and a second. And I do not know if our surveyor is in the room or not. Do we have? Mr. Enright Randolph joining us for this it one? It does not appear so. Okay. Well, we can, uh, yeah, Michelle? I, I talked to him um, um, yesterday and I thought he was attending. Um, if you like, I can try and text him and, and see if he's going to be attending. Uh, yeah, I don't wanna hold up the meeting. Uh, too long, maybe uh, text him and we can come back to that if he is able to, to make it. If not, we can put this off to the next meeting if, if he would like. Move we continue this item to a, a time indefinite. Second. Okay. Any discussion on Mr. McKim's motion? Any public comment on Mr. McKim's motion? Seeing none, we'll do a roll call vote, please. To continue. On the motion to continue, the approval of midpoint hire and to amend the 2021 salary ordinance in fund 1000, 0006 and fund 1202-0000. Councilor Wilt? Yes. Councilor Iverson? Yes. Councilor Spoonmore? Yes. Councilor Hawk? Yes. Councilor McKim? Yes. Councilor Deckard? Yes. Motion passed six to zero. 
Okay, so we'll try to pick that one up here a little bit later. In the meantime, we'll uh, move on to item number five, our highway department. Council, I move is here. Oh, there she is. Council, I move to open for discussion the highway department's ARP project, stormwater grant funding program. Please note that this is a discussion only. No vote can or will be made this evening, given that the county's ARP plan has not been developed or approved. Second, please. Second. second. Thank you. Okay. So we'll open up discussion on this. Welcome, Ms. Ridge. Thanks for Welcome. joining us. Good evening, and thank you for hearing me out on this topic. Um, and I realize you do not have a, a um, program in place for the ARP money, and I was informed of that. However, we are on a timeline um, for this grant. Uh, the Indiana Finance Authority is accepting applications right now just until July 15th. We have three projects that are shovel ready. And after our uh, meeting today with our consultant that we brought on board to help us with these grant op opportunities, works with many counties throughout the state and said that we are far further along than any county um, or entity that they have worked with that um, we are past preliminary engineering and we are done with right away with these projects and they're ready to go. That is what um, Indiana Finance Authority is looking for for these projects to be a, a, a match. It's a 50-50 match, just like our community crossing um, projects. We presented this to the stormwater board at the June, June meeting. Uh, they were su supportive of moving forward with submitting these three projects. It would be Baby Creek Project, Baby Creek Road, Morse Creek Pike, Morse, Morse Creek Road, and Stip Road. Um, the total cost for those projects are $6 million. So the local match would be approximately $3 million is what we would be asking for in the three applications. It is not required, but on the application, it does ask where your local funding is coming from. And it is preferred that it comes from the local art monies that were given from uh, the higher levels. Um, so that's kind of where I'm at. Um, I know we've discussed at our board meetings um, and over the last six months, eight months, probably when we re uh, raised the stormwater fee and then came the annexation discussions. So, um, if we could have the opportunity to use the funding from the ARP for the three million, um, that would get those three projects completed. They would not be laying on a shelf. We would not have to bond. Uh, it wouldn't affect our future revenue uh, when the annexation can take place, if it does take place. And then we would also be able to, the way we see it, we might be able to go ahead and locally fund Carmola Drive project so everything that's been invested into these major infrastructure projects could be completed um, and not bonded for for the next 10 years, which would, um, you know, basically tie you up on what you can do for future projects. It can keep us moving forward with a long range plan. It can keep us moving forward with the stormwater fee and what we can do in house. We have hired the new inspector, uh, Erica Pena. It's working out great. Um, she is off and running. So that was our first goal for the increase of the stormwater fee. And our second goal was to finish these infrastructure projects. So I'm not sure what your process is. And actually uh, the way the timeline goes for this, the first round is due July 15th and they are making a decision on the projects in August. Um, they, want the, um, they want the projects ready to go to bid by April 1st. Uh, with construction to begin immediately following that in 2022. We have till 2024 to finish the projects um, using the ARP funds from the state if we're awarded that. And um, so it would, I guess, maybe I would be requesting for 2022 ARP funds because that's when construction would be for these projects. It's just on the application, I have to put whether or not we're using ARP funds or if we're using other funds. Not to put you on the spot, it, this just all came about in the last probably three weeks. And so we jumped on the opportunity, we started the applications and we just thought this was a great opportunity to um, complete some, some major improve, improvement projects with um, the timeline of, of the ARP funds becoming available and these applications being put out there. Um, it's in our discussions that we feel that we have a really 
good shot at uh, being very competitive with these three applications. So when you mention our discussions, are you does that involve the commissioners as well? The commissioners have been involved. Uh, Kelsey presented it to them to the stormwater board in June. They are very um, supportive of going this route. Um, and with ARP, ARP funding? With okay. the ARP funding. Um, so yeah, and I guess I in our discussions, we discussed it at the stormwater board. I wasn't there. I wrote a letter to the board. Um, I've attached it to all your documents. Um, and then we've been meeting with um, Patty Yant from Lockmuller Group. She used to work for IDEM. She's very familiar with these um, types of grants. That's why we brought that firm on board. Um, and she has stayed on top of it, keeping us informed. Uh, we met with her this morning at nine, told her where we were at with our projects, uh, what our timelines were. And she said, without a doubt, you guys are farther along than any project that I've talked to in the state. So she said, I really, she said, I'm really excited. I, I feel you guys have a great shot at these applications. So we started them today, um, hoping our timeline to try and get them, uh, we wanna get them submitted, not wait till the 15th. Um, sometimes if you get an application, grant application submitted and they might want some more information, then they can reach out to you before that deadline. Um, so that's kind of where I'm at with this request. Got it. And I see Ms. Tatoni is in the attendees list. Do we, should we get her in included? Yeah, she's a, here if you had any questions. Okay. Um, I, she just, um, that way, if, if there was something I can't answer, she's yep. she's a great one for the technical part of this and, and, and where we're at. Okay, perfect. Mr. McKim, did you have a question? Yeah, I, I have a couple actually, sorry. There's several process questions and then a, and then a question about the projects. Uh, but as far as the process goes, so you're saying that you need to have this application in by July 15th. That's and you have to one. identify the source of local funds. Mm -hmm. um, and so, I mean, I, I guess what all, what does having those local those local funds in hand actually mean? Because I think it would be nearly impossible to actually have an appropriation by then. Just um, given I, the, just, from the way I understand it, I explained to um, Patty today that I was coming to the council just to ask to use the funds. Um, and I think as long as we have that local um, that that is the direction we're going. Maybe it's just on the application. You, 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 they specifically spell out the different types of funding that could be used for this, for your local match. One of them is the ARP funding. The other one is local funds or other funds. And you are to specify which one you're using. Patty said that, like I said, it was not in the meetings that she has set in on uh, these board meetings. It is not a requirement. It is a recommendation to use the ARP funding that the local entities got for this type of grant. So what would you use if are the ARP funding were not available? Then I think we would have to go to the bonding method. Okay, so you do a revenue bond on, on stormwater revenue then. Mm -hmm. um, uh, yeah. And then is, is it only one funding source can be used for local? Uh, so for example, would it have to be all? Uh, ARP funding, or could we fund, you know, a million of ARP funding, and you could find two million dollars? I mean, just as an example from so some it's other three, locals. it's three different applications, and the only risk okay. that I can see that you would be doing there is you might not get that project because you're not using ARP funds on that project. So you're saying that ARP funds actually provide a, a kind of a boost on this on whatever scoring criteria, it actually makes the Yes. the project more likely it is of highly, success. The, the wording that we were received from it, it is highly recommended that if you submit for this grant that you use our funding for your local match. So there are three separate projects. So there'd be three separate applications. Mm -hmm. And what are the amounts for each yes. approximately? Okay, I don't have them right in front of me. I typed them out today. It come, um, let's see, Baby Creek was mm -hmm. 3.2, so half of that. Um, uh, 0.9 million, just under a million for Morse Creek and 1.9 million for Stip Road. That's correct. So I believe it came Thank out you. to right at about 3 million as our match. Thank you. And then I guess my final question is about the um, the projects themselves. Do you, do you have an estimate of the approximate number of residents that would be served by each of these, each of these projects? Well, is that part of the, is that part of the, is that part of the application? Yeah. Um, I would say that on the purpose and the need for the projects is where we will go into detail, um, especially Baby Creek, because that is a one way in, one way out for 12 residents. Um, so that's a big public 
safety or safety concern. Um, Stip Road, Morris Creek Road, it serves many. There's a campground um, in that vicinity. It has a lot of lake um, uh, traffic. So it would be hard, you know, I would say we probably, the summer traffic is a lot more, but I'm gonna guess we get 500 cars a day maybe on Stip Road. So it's a public safety issue for us that we look at. And that was, that was really why those three pro projects were chosen to be our top ranking projects when we adopted this uh, long range plan. Thank you. Mr. Decker. Yeah, thank you very much. And I just wanna make sure I've got the numbers correctly. The entire project total is 6 million. We'd be coming up with three, the matching grant would give us the other three. Yes. Can you think of another time where they have said it is highly recommended, but not required. And we have done the opposite and been successful. I do. I have not been in, I have not been involved in a situation like that. I'm not sure that this type of funding has become available at this magnitude for stormwater um, projects to be specifically mentioned. Um, again, I've only been with the stormwater part of the department for six years, but nothing like this has come up in front of us before. We did look at some grant options last fall uh, before Kelsey came on and before Terry left. And there was nothing out there that was a 50-50 match. It might have been more of the um, help that and the assistance that we saw was loans. Uh, it, wasn't, it wasn't near to a 50-50 match like this. I, I, love the, I love the notion of getting the matching dollars so we don't pay for it. Mm -hmm. There's just, I have, I have a little frustration with a, if, if a county's got determining where money comes from and that being dictated to, well, we want you to do this, that, that can be a little frustrating, but it is what I think, it is. It, you know, there's a lot of unanswered questions about this. I don't even think that they've set a cap yet and applications have already been sent out and, and they are making... I don't know that I've ever submitted a grant that July 15th and they're gonna have a decision in 30 days on these. Okay, thank you very much. Ms. Waltz. Um, yes, and I would like to, um, could you talk a little bit more about the Baby Creek Road project because it is so much more than the other two. And you mentioned it serves 12 Huh. residents and granted if it's the only way in and out I get it. it's really important for those 12 people but why is it so much more um it's the magnitude of the project there's four huge culverts being replaced I believe they're going to be replaced with concrete boxes uh it's a washout problem for that whole road um our stormwater uh our bridge crew just put in two culverts um, probably two weeks ago in a different location on baby creek Friday night those were completely washed out um, when this road washes out, there is no way in for a, a, a safety vehicle at all, emergency vehicle. It also ties in with um, bridge 629 is the bridge that goes in to Baby Creek just off Brummins Creek. That has received fiscal funding for um, construction of uh, fiscal year 2026. So we were tying in those two big projects together. Um, but this is one of the areas where our residents do get locked in. Okay, sorry. <laughs> All right. Any, uh, yes, uh, Councilmember Hall. Yes. Um, not looking at map, uh, are any of these projects within the area proposed to be annexed? No. Uh, can you tell me why we opted to leave out uh, Carmola Drive? Uh, the only reason why we opted to opt, opted out to leave that out because it is not shovel ready. It is still in design phase and still have to buy right of way. Um, and the reason why we kind of halted that is due to funding because we started that probably a year and a half ago. Um, but it, we don't want to completely take that project off the table. We felt like this is something that we could look at different avenues of being able to go ahead and do that if we didn't have to bond and pay out of our um, cash balance for these projects, and then we could satisfy and do all four projects. This was kind of the best scenario we saw to be able to do it without having a 10 year bond and being committed to that also. Any other questions or comments? <clears throat> 
Okay. Um, well, so so what are the next steps? I guess you need a you need to know whether or not we can get this information on the application, right? I guess, and I like I said, I I'm not here to put you guys on the spot yeah. and commit three million dollars to the stormwater. Um, but when we got the application and it was it, it when we we received notification immediately that it was coming out, it came out in two weeks. Um, and then it was have 30 days to get it back in and then real life. And we were told up front that it was a recommendation. It was a recommendation, not a requirement. Uh, it was favorable that you use our funds. So. Yeah. So I'm not sure what the next step is. Our, our, we put ourselves on a deadline with our consultant that I would have my part of the application. Kelsey would have her part of the application done by July 1st. Um, so because July 4th falls in there, so a lot of people are on vacation. Um, and then I'm out the week that it's due. Not that I cannot become available through remote. I, I will do, if that's what it takes, I will. Um, but uh, that's kind of where we're at. And, and I brought it, we brought it to you and put it on your agenda as soon as we, as soon as the applications came out and we saw that. Yeah, and I very much appreciate being able to have this discussion here before ahead of having to make any uh, decisions on it. And, it, and like, again, it's really looking at 20, the 2022 funding mm -hmm. because that's when construction would be, Sorry. we wouldn't even go to bid it until next year. So it's just basically saying we're going to commit. Yeah, $8, so that's the eight million. So we will commit three million dollars okay. to stormwater. Got it. Okay, I saw. Uh, so we've got who's first here? Uh, Ms. Wilts, and then Mr. Iverson, and then Ms. Hawk. Uh, yes. Um, just, I just wanted to make sure I understood. You will be applying for this money, regardless of what we say. I feel like we would have to. I I can't see not when we have these shovel ready projects. However, we can go to get the money to build them. Mm -hmm. um, and you don't get the opportunity. It's like the community crossings projects. You don't get that opportunity to have it funded fifty percent. Usually, you know, federal aid projects are eighty twenty. So, right. Right. Um, okay. I, yeah, I whether we have to put on there that we're going to go through and do revenue bonds. Um, or some maybe even put one of them that we could pay completely local funds um, out of stormwater. Um, however, you know we haven't completed our 2022 budget yet. Um, those aren't due yet. Still, you know, want to figure out equipment, things like that. Um, and you know we've. Um, so yeah, it's. I know there's a lot of unanswered questions. I'm kind of was blown away today too and in the last month so yeah sure okay thank you all right go ahead Ms. Robertson thank you uh you know I obviously stormwater has, plays a huge impact in the way that our community is going to be resilient to climate change and things like this are really important as even as we saw the flooding that happened over the weekend we know that the the modeling seems to indicate that's going to happen more frequently uh, and so it obviously is, is an important project. Uh, but uh, uh, Mr. President, I wanted to ask a couple questions about process. At this point, um, I think it, the public, I, for, the, for the public, I think it's important to note that there is not a plan at this point to use the ARP money at this point, correct? And, and I think- Yeah, that, that decision is still outstanding. Right. It, there's just so much, I think, Ms. Ridge, as, as you mentioned, there's so many unanswered questions and there's so much potential here, um, both uh, with the highway department and everywhere else that uh, this, you know, I, I think there's just, there's just a lot of unanswered questions right now that, um, that I, I would want answered, you know, before we moved ahead on something like this. Um, uh, Ms. Hawk and then Mr. McKim. Uh, yes, I, I'll just say that I'm very much against uh, trying to use a revenue bond for this in this kind of a dollar amount. Uh, so if there's a, a situation where we have the ARP money uh, to, to place with this money, 
you know, then that means we've got the whole thing done for six million and it's all been coming from other sources. But I don't know what what plan is in place or being prepared to be put in place for the use of this art money. I mean, I haven't been involved with any of those meetings uh, or heard about what the direction might be. Uh, but if we plan to move forward with this at any time in the near future, this sounds like the better way to go. But I understand the public thought they were going to be a part of the plan of how to use the art money. Um, but do we turn our back on a $3 million uh, assistance? So difficult question. Ms. McKim? Oh, I, I don't want to say anything that differently than Councillor Hawk just said. I, I, I struggle with it as well. I certainly um, like the idea of having $6 million of investment from the outside in Monroe County infrastructure, but I also struggle with um, kind of short-circuiting a more systematic look at um, how we're going to spend the entire uh, ARPA funding uh, for a project that that because of the because of the short time deadline on it, so I'm 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 struggling. I I don't know where, yet where to come down on that. But but I you know I certainly do like the idea of, of that kind of investment in our infrastructure. Okay. Well, if there's nothing uh, if there's nothing further, uh, we'll we'll continue this conversation. And if there are questions that come up from council members, Ms. Ridge. Um, we can contact you. Sure. Who else? Any other suggestions on uh, who we should be contacting with questions? Commissioner's office or um, yeah, Stormwater. if you'd like to, yeah, uh, feel free to reach out to myself, the Stormwater Board. Uh, they were in, uh, in support of it um, at their Jan or June meeting. Um, if you want, if somebody wants to reach out to the Indiana Finance Authority and talk to them about this grant. Um, that's who's uh, um, yep. running the program. Got it. And so this, and if, if there are a request to be made, it, that would require a vote on our end of things. And, and that would be at what, what meeting are you thinking in terms of needing a response or an official decision? If we wait to submit those applications, then they're due July 15th. So that would be the July regular session meeting that we would need to take that into consideration. Okay, so that gives us all a sense of what the timeline is that we're working on. And uh, okay. yeah, Ms. Hawk. Uh, were all three uh, commissioners in attendance at that meeting of the Stormwater Board? I mean, did they all three say yes, they prefer using the ARP money? Kelsey, do you, were they there? Uh, Lee was not present. But I see Lee is present at this meeting, but yeah. I'm sorry, I was sick at that time, um, but I do agree with the other commissioners. I mean, I didn't vote, but in spirit, I'm there. Okay, thank you, Commissioner Jones. So it sounds like all, all three commissioners were supportive of the plan. Okay. Okay. Thank you for hearing me out. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for joining us. I'm glad we had this discussion tonight and we'll be in touch uh, if there's any questions. Uh, and likewise, you know, if, if there's any uh, additional information you need on our end, let us know. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So that wraps up item number five. Actually, I'm I'm sorry, Mr. President, I, yes. sorry. I, I just wanted to make more, one more comment about it. Sure. I just want to make it clear that everybody understands that to be able to spend ARPA funding, it needs to be in the plan, which is passed by the county commissioners. So that's that's kind of the next step, regardless of, mm -hmm. of what we decide would come from the commissioners, which, you know, whom uh, uh, before any appropriation would be requested from the council. So that's procedurally, that would be the next step is to at least have a plan passed that would it would incorporate projects like this within the scope which is why i asked if all three commissioners were there but now we see that they all have 
have, it appears they intend to include this in the plan or they wouldn't have said uh, that they uh, approve moving forward with this. But this, my understanding is this would not be an appropriation request for early, for our July regular session meeting, just be more of kind of a commitment, asking for a commitment from the council to do that at a later time. But Mr. McKim is very, uh, a good point that the, the plan needs to reference this. If any of this is gonna happen, the plan needs to reference that. Um, and we would probably wanna see that in a plan by the time we make any kind of commitment on it in July, I would imagine. But these are all things we'll, we'll just need to continue to discuss. I don't think we can figure it out uh, here in this meeting right now, but uh, some very good points have been raised and uh, I'm glad we were able to, uh, to get this initial uh, discussion done tonight. Any other questions or comments? Okay. So we will now move on to item six. And this will be item 6A, our sheriff's office. Council, I move to approve the sheriff's request for a new position, administrative data analyst, and to simultaneously amend the 2021 salary ordinance in fund 1000-0005, general fund sheriff, and add account line 15160, administrative data analyst, 40 hours, PAT 3 non-exempt. Second. All right, and Captain Davis of the Sheriff's Office is well, uh, with us. Welcome, Mr. Davis. Good evening, Council, and uh, I apologize for my background. I'm actually out of state with the Sheriff as well. We were in Phoenix this week, so I uh, appreciate the opportunity to come back in front of the Council to talk about this new position. Um, I don't really know, honestly, what to add that I've not already discussed with uh, the council and with the PAC committee, but uh, the sheriff and I very much would like council support in creating and adopting this position. Very good. And uh, I can sympathize with you. You've attended a, a number of meetings now. I think we're all very uh, familiar with this. Um, and I don't know if uh, PAC President Deckard would like to provide any uh, additional detail on kind of the, the pack end of things, but uh, I think at this point, most of us are pretty familiar with this, but feel free, Mr. Decker, if you have any information that you'd like to share. Thank you very much, Mr. President and members of the council. <clears throat> I do also appreciate Captain Davis and his patience through our process. We were very deliberative as PAC attempts to always be, and we actually had this in PAC. We sent it to council to get a little bit of your thoughts on it. It then went back to PAC, off to WIS. WIS sent it back to us and it was adopted with the unanimous vote of the PAC committee in our last meeting. And uh, we have, we've had some healthy discussion around this and certainly maybe a little bit more today, but I appreciate very much Captain Davis working with us to, to, to get this before you today in the form that it is in. Thank you. Excellent report. Thank you, Mr. Decker. Any other questions uh, or comments from council members on this request? Mr. Iverson. Only thing I would add very quickly is that the, the reports that were released by the county this morning uh, on the county's website um, are, are very clear that this is probably the one of the things that we should be doing as a, as a council. Um, and I, th I think that this is going to help um, uh, some uh, adjacent processes as well. And the reports you're Speaking of, or the criminal justice recommendation Thank report. Yeah, yeah. Study. Thank you, Mr. President. Yes, that, that is the reports that I'm referring to. Got it. Any other comments or questions from council? Okay, seeing none. Is there any public comment? There is no public comment that I can see, so we'll do a roll call vote, please. On the motion to approve a new position and to amend the 2021 salary ordinance in fund 1000-0005. Councilor Hawk? Yes. Councilor Deckard? Yes. Councilor Iverson? Yes. Councilor Wiltz? Yes. Councilor McKim? Yes. Councilor Spoonmore? Yes. Motion passed six to zero. 
All right. Thank you very much. Enjoy the heat out there, Captain Davis. You, you bet. <laughs> yeah. All right. Up next is item 6B. Council, I move to approve the health department's request for two new positions, environmental health services manager and population health and outreach manager, and to simultaneously amend the 2021 salary ordinance in fund 1159-0000 health fund and add account line 10122 environmental health services manager, 35 hours PAT 5 exempt and account line 10123, Population Health and Outreach Manager, 35 hours, PAT 5 exempt. Second. All right. Welcome, Ms. Caudill. This has been another one that we've been working on for a while. Yes. We're here at the end of the tunnel. Yes, we started with this really last year during the budget hearing. So really, it's kind of, it has been a full circle year. So thank you for moving it forward and hearing it tonight. I. You know, these are two positions we have had, it was several years ago, I think 2015 that we did kind of an assessment of uh, where we were kind of staffing and what were the first priorities that we really needed to kind of focus on. Um, and we didn't really have, and to this day, don't have a lot of true managers. All of our supervisors are still kind of in the field doing the work um, side by side with the other people that they're um, supervising. So these will be very uh, good positions that will put us in, I think, a position to streamline things in terms of environmental health, in terms of doing more cross-training, keeping uh, things, looking at where our priorities are and what we need to do and being able to shuffle things around. And I will tell you one thing, I know we've had this discussion before, and I'm going to throw this in here because you know, we talked about some of the struggles that we have had since fall um, and 2020 with just the septic uh, program and trying to stay abreast. And there were certainly lots of challenges that we had, but we ran some numbers looking at January through April. And January through April, new installations, I'm not talking about septic repairs, complaints, uh, real estate inspections, just new installations. In um, 2019, we had 99 requests. In 2020, we had 84, so it didn't drop very much. And January through April of this year, we had 154. Wow. So, you know, if no, for no other reason, that can tell you why, why we've been struggling. And um, certainly, I don't know that that's going to slow down. And so I think that these these positions will certainly help us. In terms of what's before you, I don't have a lot to add except, I think the environmental health position when that, that manager position is pretty self-explanatory. Um, WIS did come back and with the population health and outreach manager, they recommended that that be a community health manager because we switched the names of our the titles for our health educators to community health specialists, but I do not recommend that. And we, we've hashed this out and spent a lot of time talking about it and trying to process that ourselves. Um, one of my concerns, and I've had people at IU Health or at the School of Public Health uh, say the same thing. You know, we have our public health clinic. We contract with IU Health community health services for our public health clinic. And to add a community health services manager or division, I think would just create more confusion. And while we moved our health educators to community health specialists, and that really opens up the ability for us to find applicants. When I, Dr. Lo Sherwood Laughlin, for instance, said, you know, our students will be able to find your positions now much easier than if they're labeled health educators. So I think that was a good move, but I do not think that the division name has to be the same. And it, I did go to the School of Public Health and I talked with Dr. Sherwood Laughlin and with Dr. Forrest and with Alex Purcell. And all of them felt that the population health manager and outreach manager made sense. Uh, the CDC has an office of population health. 
Uh, when we talk about public health accreditation, there is population health and outreach that's involved in that. And that manager position is really looking at the a broader scope than just education. So they're looking at the epidemiology of it all. They're looking at the data and the assessments that we need and all of that outreach that we do and how it interacts with our total population. So that's the reason that I want that title change and do not agree with WIS's recommendation on that title. Uh, and thank you for that uh, clarifying information there, because you're right, that, that there was a little confusion around that, and that meeting that day was just kind of uh, confusing in general. We didn't know if we were meeting virtually <laughs> or in person. It was just kind of a comedy of errors, so there was a lot of uh, confusion going around that day, but I fully support uh, that, uh, that, that title and position name. I think that's uh, absolutely appropriate. Thank you. And then... Um, We'll check with Mr. Deckard first, just as, as PAC president, as we always do on these things. Uh, did you have any additional uh, insight or information that you wanted to share? I just wanted to echo what uh, Penny Cottle was saying about Wiz came back with the recommendation on that title. We worked in PAC to uh, amend that to keep that consistent with Penny's recommendation. We, we tend to follow Penny's guide on, on things, whether it's COVID or getting that title right. And I agree wholeheartedly with her. This was adopted out of PAC for both of these uh, position and positions. And, and by the way, that PAC meeting uh, that we've discussed a couple of times, it was the first and so far, I think the only uh, in-person um, meeting that the county has had due to the governor's order coming late. And when uh, notice was released on that meeting, and I appreciate everybody's um, trial of errors as we got through that, we did some good things. But yeah, it was a, a, was a quote unquote hybrid meeting. Yes. I think was the official term of it. But yeah, it was interesting. We'll be ready for uh, next on month. cats if you want to watch it. Um, Ms. Hawk, did you have another PAC member? Uh, Ms. Hawk. Yes, I really appreciate Ms. Cottle uh, discussing the reason why this title uh, needs to be because we perhaps uh, work our health department different than some. And as a reminder, it has not been that many years ago that we were using, uh, trying to uh, get an assistant in the council office and it was advertised in such a way that we didn't get many applicants because they thought it was a counseling service as in not the fiscal body. And so it may, it, words mean something and titles mean something. And so if this will help us get uh, the correct applicants, well, let's just do it. What works for Monroe County? Yes, uh, Mr. McKim. I'm, I'm particularly excited about the, um, the environmental health services manager. Uh, Ms. Cottle and I have had many discussions about uh, septic related issues I know and I, and I know that uh, um, simple capacity has been just a, a real issue for the department just not enough hours in the day to get everything done that needs to be done so I, I, I you know I, I've seen this I think in at least three different situations relatively recently that uh, that that's been an issue so yeah I, I'm glad to support anything the land capacity of that division very important for uh, community development, very important for housing, you know, all these things that we, that we support, you know, if we're going to do housing in the county, um, we're going to need to have septic and the septics need to be maintained. So. And it, if I may, when you, when you talk about that, I know one of the other challenges we had was when our database crashed and our tech services department scrambled and they were great. They put, got data, but it was still hard to maneuver and, and we couldn't find a lot. One of our part-time people who is a student uh, and works with us part-time was able to take what tech services was able to get for us and put it in a new database so that now we can find that information in a much more uh, efficient manner. So, you know, kudos to tech services for not losing that information. That was big. Um, and then to Lynette for putting that together so that we could find what we have. 
Yeah, that was a great team effort. And I know tech services really came through to, yes. to save that, they did. that database. All right, uh, Mr. Iverson. I don't know that I have too much more to add, except that I think this really showcases, uh, Penny, your leadership. Um, we know, you know, you got our community this far in the pandemic and, and just these positions really address community needs. And we're so thankful that, you know, you have the, the foresight and the leadership to bring these to us and to, to do that. So we're just really, really appreciative and glad I can be the liaison to the health department. So we're, we're glad to have you. Here, here. Okay. Anything further? Questions, comments, any public comment? There is no public comment, so we'll do a roll call vote, please. Hey, sister. On the motion to approve two new positions and to amend this 2021 salary ordinance in fund 1159-0000. Councilor Iverson. Yes. Councilor Spoonmore. Yes. Councilor Deckard. Yes. Councilor Wiltz. Yes. Councilor Hawk. Yes. Councilor McKim. Yes. Motion passed six to zero. Thank you. And uh, Councilperson Iverson, I do have an answer to your question earlier, if I might be able to answer that. Sure. Yes, please do. So out of the breakthrough cases, uh, breakthrough cases as a percent of those who are fully vaccinated is 0.082%. Is that for Monroe County or statewide? That is statewide. That's that's still very telling. Yeah, we've Get had... your vaccine. It yes. is very important. Get yes. your vaccine. Yes. Yeah. And the hospitalizations, ICU and all of that are fractions of a percent of those cases. Yeah, yeah, that's what I was going to say. They're, they're much more protected. Yes. Uh, from, from, okay. Thank you very much, Ms. Caudill. And uh, we look forward to keeping in touch. Next item is uh, item seven. Council, I move to open for discussion the proposed 2021 general obligation bond projects as presented by the Board of Commissioners. Second. Okay. Hello, Ms. Purdy. Hello again. Um, and I have two of my commissioners also in the audience. So Commissioner Thomas and Commissioner Jones are also here. Um, if TSC would allow, I could share my screen to show the, the proposed um, project list. Um, Go it ahead. was sent. Thank you. It was emailed, I believe, to you guys um, a couple of weeks ago. And um, here we go. Hang on just one second. There we go. And so I thought um, it might be a good time to kind of talk about this a little bit more with you guys. Um, it is, you know, the commissioners are seeking your, um, the final um, approval of, of the bond projects. Um, so, and I know that somebody's going to ask me about the bond timeline. And I spoke with um, Jeff Cockrell, and he said, if we can have a finalized list in, in August, that'd be fabulous. With the first reading in September would be great. So to give you that kind of timeline um, background, I thought that might be helpful. And um, as you will notice, this, these items here in the purple, um, these are body cams for the jailers and the deputies, MDTs for the police vehicles and the MBT is a mobile uh, data terminal. And that number is, is higher than what may be in your packet um, because the document I sent um, had 145,000 in that line. And um, Mr. Evans sent me an email at the end of today with an updated um, number. So that's what that is reflected there. We, the, he got two quotes and the other one was 220 or 202,000. So. And he, he looked into both and this particular um, product and vendor would be is the one that he was recommending. And then the jail cell locks at 300,000. I put these in purple um, because you, I think that you have some options with those particular um, items. And what I'm wanting to do is, 
Um, <laughs> sorry. Is show you. Okay, so there we go. We have currently four million four hundred ninety-three um, thousand dollars in projects. The goal is for a three million dollar bond. So, an option for you to consider is these here in purple for the all all sheriff jail related. Um, the public safety lit has um, a, a, a balance um, beyond what's been appropriated um, in that particular fund. Um, additionally, the body cams and the de um, for the deputies and jailers, we have learned can be used for, with the um, revenue, um, uh, revenue, uh, the lost revenue, I've gone blank, sorry. Um, Funds so that um, it's not just a straight, you just can't use any of the ARP funds, but we can use revenue loss and recovered. So that could be used for the body cam numbers. Um, the other item I wanted to put on here is our, um, when I put on here the, the non LEO, that's non law enforcement um, officer vehicles, so that's for. Uh, our general population and employees who um, have vehicles that they require for their to do their business. The other item in purple is the back truck, and I, I think actually, I don't know if Marty brought this up at the last time, also along with the YSB project or not, but that is something that may be um, considered from the stormwater um, project. So if you want to see how that affects your bottom line. Let's just drag this out. And let's take you. Put you there. And that gives us that gives us down to three million eighty five thousand. And with the exception of you know, we could reduce that to, to three million um, only because, with the exception of the reports from the vehicles for highway, um, there's some fluidity um, in some of these projects, like for the solar infrastructure, the the sidewalk design connector for Bachelor. Um, there's some there's some fluid movement in there in that we wouldn't necessarily need the full five hundred thousand for that, so we could take eighty five thousand off to bring the number down to to three million. So those were just some fun things for you to think about. And as I said, myself and two of our commissioners are here. If you have questions, I know that um, we had asked if you guys you know, would want to send any questions prior to the meeting and we haven't received anything. Uh, so hit me. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you. And uh... I'm glad that we've got some additional options uh, to work with here. And we've, we've had some messages that we've been trading back and forth on that. So you know, that, that helped to alleviate uh, some of the questions that I had. Uh, but it's nice to know that we do have some options to, to lower that bond amount that we could use some other sources uh, for potentially. Do we have any, uh, uh, looks like Mr. Kim has his hand up. Uh, thank you. Uh, as for those, the, um... Uh, law enforcement related, the public safety related uh, expenses in purple above. I certainly do su support all three of those uh, projects. Um, in fact, several of them are, are quite urgent. Um, we do have a substantial cash balance in the public safety lit fund. We had we have an operating balance of I think it was like 50% uh, this year plus. Uh, we had an additional 200,000 that came from the supplemental lit distribution that didn't even, you know, that wasn't even accounted for in any of our, in any of our planning. So I would definitely support uh, paying, you know, buying or going ahead with all three of those projects, but going, going for an appropriation out of uh, public safety lit. Um, on the bachelor sidewalk connector, can we hear a little bit more about that? And also the, my main question is, 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 any or all of that in an area that's proposed to be annexed? I cannot answer any of that, those questions, but I suspect that Commissioner Thomas can, not to put her on the spot. 
Okay, I can I can be on the spot. Hey everyone, okay. uh, thanks for having us here today. Um, uh, yeah, some of that area is um, um, in the area proposed for annexation, but you know that's something that hangs over our head all the time. Um, with the addition of the library at um, Bachelor Middle School campus area, um, I think it's it's really important to have. Um, some sort of uh, connector for folks who are coming from the area of Country Club and Rogers. Um, and even if we could get them um, down, moving south on Rogers, imagine the west side of the street, to the uh, housing development that's there, which has a connector into Bachelor Campus um, on the north side of the campus grounds, that would be sufficient. So one of the things uh, we've, uh, I had a discussion with uh, Ms. Rich today, um, so one of the things we might we might do in, in sort of a, obviously these are these are just general ideas right now, um, but as we tweak these numbers before we put them in the final bond, one of the things we may do is um, perhaps move the sidewalk to uh, design um, for half the amount um, and uh, for 20, uh, 22 and then for the following year do a construction bond um and uh the other thing we could do with that money that other two hundred fifty thousand, is we could pay for at least half of the back truck um so uh that's an option right so we're still you know we're still fine-tuning the numbers but i think we wanted to get your sort of last guidance on this before we put this together into bond documents to present back to you um just after budget time so, so that that five hundred thousand dollars, even though it says design there, that five hundred thousand dollars actually includes design and some construction as well. Yes. Yeah. Right but, away. But if, yeah. Okay. But it, yeah. but if it, if for this year it were design only, which is probably all we could do this year, two hundred fifty thousand would be adequate. Probably. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, I don't disagree that that side sidewalk is necessary given the new library. That's a yeah. very worthy project. Yeah. And you know, it's it's. It's something to think about that, you know, we often think, well, if they're going to annex it, the city should should put the sidewalk in. But there's a lot of parts of the city that don't have sidewalks still. So, you know, if we want to make sure there's a sidewalk there, maybe we should move forward with it. Uh, but I do think it'll benefit a lot of residents. And I think the the number of people traversing on foot will increase um, as, you know, once the library opens, because that's going to be a really hot sort of hub there for activity. So. Agree entirely. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Harrison. Yeah, could you talk a little bit more about what's involved in the solar project? Yes. Yeah, so what we're working through right now is getting uh, consultants um, to give us a report on the whole of the county. We haven't had one done since 2012, so it's time to do one again. But one of the things we want to do is as we buy um, non-law enforcement vehicles is to move toward hybrid gas electric or all electric vehicles and to charge them off of Duke would be kind of shameful. So we would like to charge them off of solar panels if we can. So this is really focused on that highway emergency operations center campus area where we are already doing some solar panels, but we can do more um, and that's really our focus first and foremost. Um, and it's related to the buildings, but also to fleet. Yeah, and I, I want to toss in there, um, Julie, because Greg and I were also speaking, and I think you were too, um, about the, the um, showers parking lot and the ability to put some of those, um, the solar panels in that particular area and um, provide the, uh, the plugins for the electric vehicles and then we also might be looking at additional plugins to the parking garage so um we're definitely so, looking at moving toward a more um solar supported energy yeah that's fantastic uh, the four hundred thousand dollars that's the consulting fee to look at where solar might be feasible but it's also installation actually um the last note I got from um, our fleet and building manager said that he had been speaking with um, a vendor who's been who's doing uh, 
panel's on the EOC at the moment, and he's quite, he's quite willing. Sorry, um, he is quite willing to um, do an assessment for us at no charge. So we think that's yeah. Good. yeah. <laughs> All right. Excellent. Uh, Councilmember Hawk. Uh, yes. Can you tell me if uh, the vehicles? 500,000 on non uh, law enforcement vehicles. Are any of those for uh, the U shelter? No, um, actually that's gonna be on your agenda, I think next time. Um, and that was, it's a, a van. And that was um, a project from I think maybe the 2021 bond. And I believe you were the counselor who recommended and then everybody else voted on it and approved, thought that was the best idea that we just take that money from the juvenile. Um, I think it's the either juvenile special purpose fund. Um, right, that's that's pretty rich right now. I mean, they're, they're pretty heavy with their cash balance. Uh, the other question was, have you considered any place near uh, the youth shelter where on that, property where solar panels will be going? There's actually solar panels out there already. Um, so I don't, I can't really tell you how many out there, but I do know that um, they're out there because I know I kept getting alerts when through the flood this past weekend because it was kicking them offline. So Julie, do you know how many we have out there? Uh, I can I can picture it in my mind, but I don't know the number. No, but we do have we do have an array out there, um, and um, I think I think we need to before we move forward with um, additional panels at Youth Service Bureau. I think we need to look at what we're doing with the agricultural side of it. So um, that's um, um, going to be um, important. Uh, so we don't want to shade. Uh, Mr. Deckard. Thank you very much. On my notes in the packet, it talks about um, parks that we, we've got something coming back from parks. And I may have missed it, but do you have any more on what you're thinking on parks? I do. Thank you so much for um, bringing that up. Um, that's actually been reduced. It had been 700000 because parks thought they had two potential projects. Um, the Flatwoods Park uh, making the ADA improvements um, for the um, playground. And then they were also hoping to get an IU Health Foundation grant. Um, however, we were notified that we were not gonna be considered for that grant. So um, the 400,000 is what the Parks Department has identified as the Flatwoods um, Park for uh, playground equipment. Thank you very much. I, I always am happy to see things about Flatwoods because for a lot of county residents, that is the only park that's even remotely close to them. And it's a great one. It's a great one and uh, under known. And then I, I just on this, um, on, the, on the sidewalks, potential for sidewalk connections down near Bachelor, AKA the new proposed library. I also wanna echo what everybody else has said. You know, good example. I know there, there's discussions on annexation, not a annexation, um, but sidewalks will definitely be needed. If you go north of there to the Broadview neighborhood, you will see city property that has no sidewalks, and um, there, the, there's constant movement in the area. And I think we have to be real cognizant of that. Not to mention the fact that that area is in between a hub of trail systems and um, and a grocery store and a a trailer park in about three neighborhoods at least. So just a lot to, to consider there. And I, I, I like seeing the inclusion of that. Very good. Uh, Ms. Hawk. Yes, um, I too agree that that sidewalk's essential for safety. And um, when we uh, know that many younger people will be wanting to to get to that library. They were excited about it. Uh, even a couple of years ago when we were talking about it, they were excited for that library to be coming nearby. And I do not think we dare uh, delay 
getting a sidewalk in place. So whatever we have to do to start moving forward on that. Of course, we, we know the library is not ready yet, but we cannot wait until the library is built to plan for a sidewalk. Right. Right, and the, the $200,000, the $250,000 for design, it would make perfect sense to do that immediately and then consider the construction and right away at the next phase. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to break in. I apologize. Ms. Wells? Yes, I'm going off of the sidewalk top topic. I also support sidewalks, but I'd like to uh, know about the non-LEO vehicles, are those or some of those going to be electric or hybrids? That is the hope and the intention. Now, that would be a, bet, a better conversation um, with Greg. Now, I will tell you that he's having a really difficult time currently finding any vehicles for um, to replace fleet this year. Um, I don't know if you guys are aware, but the, apparently the, the new vehicle situation is that they are scarce as hen sees and um, he's, he's getting good money for something that he can turn in from the county that's pretty well used. And he said that there's about a $5,000 increase just off the bat for um, most new vehicles if you can find them. Um, so I do think that He's definitely looking um, at the electric or the combination. And um, I, do, I do know that the other thing that we're looking at, if you'll interest you, he found these electric um, vehicles. I actually think the city might have one that goes on, that does the beeline maybe. Um, and we're looking at parks is in need of a skid steer type um, vehicle. We have one at the courthouse that is used hardly at all um, in the winter time. But the boys, the our maintenance crew could use this electric um, vehicle as opposed to the skid steer type um, vehicle. So we're looking at that. Um, so yeah, definitely, definitely looking at um, trying to find a more economic or environmentally um, responsible vehicles. Great, thanks. Welcome. And don't hesitate to send anything our way uh, to myself and Greg if you've got any ideas on any vehicles, because. Well, there's some great Ford F 150s coming out all yeah. electric, right? <laughs> <laughs> like I want to try one of those. A 10 year waiting list, yeah. I know. <laughs> no, I, I, you know, and I'm a truck girl, so I was like, yeah. <laughs> Go ahead, Mr. Kim. I'm wondering about the, the parks updated website. Um, I mean, is that let's see that that seems like a fair amount of money. Is but also is there are there other sources that that could come from? Is there any cash that uh, we could we could spend on something like that rather than borrowing for the development of a website? And what is what is specific about their website needs that go beyond? Is is it the reservations for shelters and that sort of thing? Is that what yeah. the distinctiveness is. Yeah, they, they actually have a, a, a separate website um, in addition to the one that's on our county website. And this other one is, it does involve um, the reservations and payment of fees. And I know that um, Mr. Evans is the one who provided this information and I, he, he most likely can get it less than the 38,000. As you know, he's really good at um, working some really good deals for us. Um, however, he he thinks that um, this the thirty eight thousand that he's presented. Let me remember this. Um, it would tie it into it. It be done. It would be part of our um, current website. So it'd be it might be an off site, but it'd be a click and it'd be in the same format. Um, and we could make sure that it meets the um, criteria for readability and conversion to text if someone um, can't um, or can can be read if if somebody can't read particularly. So, 
that just strikes me as something that we ought to be able to find cash to pay for. Right. Feel, yeah. Um. <laughs> um, I'll, I'll look. I, I mean, I'll, I'll dig through the, I'll look under the cushions, but uh, and come up with yeah. a better suggestion. That's just, that's just something that struck me as maybe not appropriate for a bond for borrowing okay. and raising taxes I for. Agree. Sure. Yeah, because then you could have that, you know, help offset the cost of the VAC truck or however you wanted to flex out some of these other projects. So most we'll certainly not have Eric Luke also. He's pretty good at finding some other ideas. <laughs> yeah. Great. Any other questions or comments? Okay. Um, and I um, would imagine Ms. Purdy will continue to kind of collect any information and uh, thoughts from council on this as well going forward. So please send those as, as ideas come to your mind, send those to uh, Ms. Purdy and um, we can get those incorporated. Yeah, um, that sounds great. You might want to also copy Kim just because sometimes the number of emails I get is... <laughs> Yeah. Always good to have a backup on that one. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Yep. Well, thank you very much. Very good discussion, and we look forward to keeping in touch on it. Wonderful. Thank you, guys. Yep. Okay, so that'll wrap up item seven. Up next is uh, item eight, our legal department. Council, I move to approve resolution 2021-26, notice of election to opt out of opioids settlement. All right, hello, Ms. Rice. Hello, good evening. So the resolution that I'm asking you to adopt tonight is also gonna be presented to the county commissioners tomorrow for their approval. Um, by way of background, you'll remember that Monroe County joined the litigation um, suing um, some pharmaceutical companies, it was the opioid litigation, class action litigation, and our complaint was filed February 9th of 2018. It's been, uh, we've been represented as a county, the city's also being represented by the same firm, um, Cohen and Malad out of Indianapolis. And, um, Recently, just this year, the Attorney General uh, got involved, the State General Assembly, sort of at the last minute, uh, passed legislation that provided um, that counties uh, would be part of, of um, the litigation or part of a settlement that the state of Indiana might secure. Um, and if we don't want to be part of that settlement and and I'll tell you, there's no settlement yet to be even seen. Um, so we don't know, there, there is no settlement, so there are no terms. But uh, um, the legislation is that if we don't opt out of the legislation, we will be bound by whatever settlement the state of Indiana comes up with. Our attorneys have recommended that we take advantage of the opportunity to opt out of participating with the state of Indiana. Now, if you choose, if you opt out tonight, which is my recommendation, um, and I'm going to recommend that to the commissioners tomorrow, and at some point um, you decide you wanna opt back in, there is a, there is a shorter time period um, this year that we could opt back in. So if, if you adopt this resolution as recommended and we see some, some sort of reason that we shouldn't have done that or there's some, something negative on the horizon and or something good uh, that the state of Indiana has done that we want to participate in, we can always um, opt back in, you know, in the, within that time frame. Um, however, um, we feel as if we're being well represented by Cohen and Malad, uh, we feel like they have the county's best interest in mind. And um, we think that opting out will be in the county's best interest. So, Happy to answer any questions that you might have, but I would like you to, this has to be passed by June 30th. Once you pass it and the commissioners pass it, the state law says has a process for us. We have to have the resolution certified by the auditor. We have to get them sent up to Indianapolis. We're gonna send them to our attorney first and they're gonna take it over to the state and make sure you know everything gets done the right way. 
but I would appreciate a, a positive vote to opt out tonight. Got it. Thank you. Uh, we'll see if there's any questions here. Ms. Uh, can you tell me approximately what it's going to cost the county to continue doing as we have been doing? I, I mean, that's not free. Well, it would, uh, the attorney's fees would come out of whatever, whatever proceeds we get from the litigation. So we haven't been paying outside counsel fees for this. It's a class action suit. Okay. Any other questions? Comments? Is there any public comment? All right, we'll do a roll call vote, please. On the motion to approve resolution 2021-26, Councilor Hawk? Uh, I'm going to say no. Okay. Councilor Wiltz? Yes. Councilor Deckard? Yes. Councilor Spoonmore? Yes. Councilor McKim? Yes. Councilor Iverson? Yes. Motion passed five to one. Thank you very much. All right, and I think we've, uh, item nine is another one where we get to visit with Ms. Rice. Yeah, and, and I will just make sure that you know, with that resolution, there is an accompanying notice that goes along with it. So I will have the resolution and the notice will both go to the commissioner showing your approval and their approval. So just so you know that your, your approval of the resolution is also an approval of the required notice that goes along with it. Yeah, thank you. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. So, do we have a motion and a second yet? Or should yet. I? No. Nope. Okay. Okay. Council, I move to open discussion of resolution 2015-46, supporting a midpoint hiring policy. Second. All right, I have a motion and a second. Ms. Rice, what information do you have for us on this one? Well, we, this is all about the midpoints tonight. We've had a couple of midpoint hire requests already for you tonight. Um, we have an outdated resolution. It's 2015-46. It's a resolution supporting a midpoint hiring policy. A lot has changed since 2015. This resolution needs to be reworked. Uh, we no longer have an HR director as this resolution mentions. Um, the process needs to be revisited to see how the council um, will decide whether you know, there should be a midpoint hire or not. Um, and WIS is going to help, WIS has talked with uh, Kim Shell. they're going to help us come up with some objective criteria to look at. And so what I'd like to, you know, just explain to you tonight is that we're going to need to redo this resolution. I'm not sure what it's going to read like. Ultimately, the last um, point of the current resolution says that the final decision on any request rests with the council. Obviously, that will stay the same. But what your criteria is going to be, um, you know, the knowledge, the skills, and the ability of the applicant, who's going to review those and, and make recommendations to you, I think that's up in the air. Um, and we obviously want somebody other than the department, sort of a check on the department, some objective analysis. Um, but again, our HR department doesn't look like it did in 2015, and we're not sure given the fact that we're doing this reclassification, what it's going to end up looking like. And so um, I just wanted to talk with you about it tonight, bring this to your attention, see if you had any thoughts for us. Um, and Kim, I'll open up. Kim, if you have any other thoughts that you want to share about yeah. this, please jump in. Um, but I really just want to bring it to your attention and ask you for any feedback you might have either tonight or for you to share with us going forward so that we can craft a resolution that matches what you want to see. Uh, thank you. Yeah, Michelle. Um, I just want to say that we have um, invited the HR specialist to, I think, a PAC meeting as well as like a, a council uh, staff meeting. And she just feels that um, she's, I, I don't want to say 
not qualified, but she just, she feels like at times she's just rubber stamping um, some of the requests. She's not in on the initial interviews um, and that she feels like the, um, re the uh, request that we are currently using is just inadequate. So that's why I did reach out to WIS. So, and, um, and I would like some feedback from you guys on what type of information do you wanna see on this criteria moving forward? Um, if you look at the, the one that we currently have, I mean, the, to me, the information is just basically very superficial on what you receive um, in a, you know, and it appears to me on, on the way I look at it, when you're looking at the uh, resume, you're just basically copying the information from the resume straight onto this request. And then the uh, HR specialist feels like she's doing the same thing. Now she, you know, just by using the resume um, against the job description, you know, that's where she feels like she, you know, she doesn't know those positions. So that's all she has to go by in order to make a recommendation or to you guys. So I think we just need to make sure we're having the right person uh, look at this moving forward. Got it. Okay. Thank you. Uh, uh, Ms. Birdie, yeah? Do you have a... Thank you. I didn't realize this was going to be on the, on the topic for this evening. Um, I want to add something um, in the sense that our HR specialist is as good, if not better, than what we've had in, in our um, HR department um, in the past. And I just want to state that um, I think that it, this process has always been a rubber stamp. Um, I don't believe that there has ever really been um, anyone that has that particular um, skill set, if you will, that's going to, and I'm not really sure it's a skill set um, that somebody who's in HR would necessarily have. Um, I think that the council should come up with a plan um, and think about what kind of criteria you would you would like to see. And for me, the easiest thing off the top of my head is um, this person has three years of um, financial financial um, accounting experience in a bank and at a school, um, for instance. Or this person has. Um, X number of years of experience uh, speaking publicly that somehow is going to um, connect with their job that they're that they're applying for, and I think that this require I think this request needs to be borne by the department head or the elected official that's asking for this midpoint hire um, because they're the ones who want it, and I think you guys as the fiscal body, um, if you had a nice you had a pretty easy grid, you know, that you can, people could clearly say three years experience as an attorney um, in Lawrence County. And they're coming into the Lawrence County Prosecutor's Office. They're coming into um, Monroe County and they've got three years. That's kind of a simple, easy one. Check the box, off you go. Um, that would be my recommendation to you guys. Uh, I. You know, if you want to have um, an outside person, then it might behoove you guys to consider having WIS look at those, um, but that's really going to slow the process down. But it would certainly keep them in kind of their hands in the mix of our job descriptions and how we're handling things and handling salary situations and things of that nature. Something to think about there. Um, and the last thing I would say on this is that hopefully um, with your study that you're doing, your salary study and your job description study that you're doing, hopefully um, some changes will be made there and the, the need for people to um, request the midpoint hire may, um, may go away. But it does open a whole other can of worms, um, you know, about whether or not you ever want to allow prior service to be counted. 
and how that's going to be applied. So that's all I have to say. Uh, thank, thank you. you. <laughs> thank you for that uh, insight. Uh, I saw um, Ms. McKim's hand first and then Ms. Hawk. I think we need to make sure we, before we decide on any criteria, we need to uh, have a good understanding of what the goal of the policy is. And so let's go back to what the original purpose of this policy was. And that doesn't mean it's necessarily the right one going forward. Uh, but the original purpose of this policy was this, to essentially not um, penalize a candidate or a new potential county employee because their experience happened to be, say, in another county rather than Monroe County. You know, there's the old, I, I, I think somebody keeps uh, referring to the old, uh, you know, the old joke that um, you know, Iris Kiesling could be hired as a, as a bailiff in the, in the court at, uh, courts at a higher salary than, say, uh, you know, a city of Bloomington retired police officer. Um, but it was to, to, pro to uh, provide the, uh, you know, to not disadvantage employees that have that same experience just from another jurisdiction. Now, you know, another potential goal would be to use it as, as more of a recruitment tool to be able to allow, simply allow department heads, simply raise the salary to better recruit new employees. That's not what this was, this policy was created for necessarily, but it is a perfectly valid way to look at it. Um, I just think before we come up with criteria, we need to make sure we understand exactly what the goal is. Mm -hmm. of the policy. Ms. Hawk? Uh, yes, just as a reminder, we have uh, so part of what uh, Council Member McCann was discussing. Uh, we have a situation where you might serve in, you know, 10 years of one department doing something absolutely unrelated to what this new job, maybe you've been taking uh, additional classes and so forth, that you've reached an ability to be able to uh, apply for a higher paying job within the county. And yet we seem, let's say if they've been someplace else in the county for 10 years, totally unrelated, they're getting to start at a much higher amount than maybe someone who's been in that new position for five years. So I think we need to take a look at that whole a system that we have in place that's saying they get credit for the number of years they've already served for county government. Is it totally related to the job that they are applying for? And I would like to say that I think the yep. department head should stop uh, going ahead and hiring somebody at, with the assumption that they will get uh, the go ahead from the council. That's sort of like when somebody applies for a tax abatement and they are already doing whatever they've got to do for uh -huh. the abatement or not. We frown upon that. We should be frowning upon uh, moving forward with the hire. That's a good point. Um, I guess my thoughts about this too, and I, I can uh, relate to um, much of what Ms. Purdy said. Um, I think that you know, I, I don't feel, I'm not an HR professional. Uh, I know that that is, is a council member. That is certainly my, uh, within my domain to understand a lot of these uh, situations involving county jobs. Uh, that's part of my job as a council member, but I don't have myself the skills uh, of an HR trained HR professional. That's what, um, you know, I depend on with our staff uh, to, to assist with in a lot of those decisions that we have to make as council. Um, and so I think, you know, I don't feel comfortable coming up with the criteria on my own uh, as, as somebody who doesn't have that skill set. But, you know, WIS, I think, may be able to develop some criteria for us. I'm not saying that they should, uh, you know, review every single application and resume that comes through, but they can, you know, create a list of guidelines and criteria that we can base our decisions on uh, going forward if we want to continue this policy. Um, uh, I think, you know, there there may be some decisions that have to be made based on what the the WIS salary um, 
uh, review and study comes back to be, or the, the compensation classification study comes back to be. So, you know, we'll, we may have some decisions to make on, you know, whether or not this even makes sense going forward. But uh, I do feel that WIS would be very helpful uh, and just at least helping us identify the criteria that we would make some decisions on with the existing policy. Um, I don't know whose hand was, let me see here, who is up next. Mr. Kim, Mr. Deckard, Ms. Wilkes. I wanted to say is that I don't, I, I certainly have no problem with going ahead and having WIS come up with some criteria in the relative short run, but I do think that I think Councilor Hawk kind of uh, brought this up and several others may have mentioned it too, that, that everything is in, is in context and we have to maybe reconsider the entire system of counting every year of county government experience towards the various steps, even if they're not related to one's current job. So, but I think that's a much bigger decision that we need to make now. And clearly given that we're, we're receiving midpoint hire requests right and left, I, I think it would be useful to have some, some more objective criteria in the short run. Um, Mr. Decker. Thank you very much. I, I don't have objections to to reconsidering the current criteria, revisiting this resolution and coming up with something else that would work better. I, I don't want any employee in a position where they feel like they're doing something as part of a rubber stamping because that just, that creates good, that takes good public service time and it just applies bureaucracy to it. Um, so I, I'd be for a meaningful policy that we could use and that does something, um, not a paper tiger. And it occurs to me in the time that I've been here that we've adopted most of these midpoints because probably um, based on the judgment of this council, these midpoints were needed. I think when department heads are looking at running their department and dealing with the day-to-day -day need that opens and unlocks that door and getting good bodies and, and souls in positions that they want to do everything they can to have the absolute best person. Having been a part of the state's um, bureaucratic end of things. I, I know that that was always my sentiment when I was there and I would use within the system every lawful regulation I could to get the best people that I wanted. I'd like to see what we can do in this process to help attract the best people and not make um, prior service that would be relevant punitive in any way. Um, again, there are apples and oranges between jobs, but there's a public factor and there's time working for the public that I don't think should ever be diminished. It is, you know, 20 years in public service, no matter where it is, when you're facing the public, there's a lot to that. So again, if we could come up with something that would work, not be bureaucratic in the sense that we're going through motions that nobody's happy with, and it's just bad oatmeal that we're eating, I would be really good with that and, and maybe this comes down to us ourselves as we did tonight looking at a, a, a blanked anonymous resume and looking at it and saying yeah that to me looks like a midpoint I would want that person um, and, and making decisions thank you oh, Ms. Welts and then Ms. Hawk Um, I also agree that um, having WIS weigh in on this might make things easier. I had a question though about the existing uh, resolution um, and because at the, at the end of it, part four um, talks about evaluation and having the, um, having PAC look at the, um, the effectiveness of the policy following each decision. And I'm wondering if that's ever happened. And um, if so, how those discussions went and if they have anything to bear on this discussion and maybe PAC should be involved in taking this forward um, and helping with with evaluating what you know what we should be doing, um, I'm just looking at the resolution and wondering how that fits. And I can ask for Trent. Do you want to go ahead? 
Yeah. You go ahead, Ms. Rice. You've I was just going to say, I don't, I don't recall that number four, the part of the evaluation, which says that, you know, PAC is to determine whether or not the criteria set out in the policy are sufficient to allow departments to hire highly qualified people um, who will substantially boost the ability. And um, I don't know that that's actually been practiced or followed. Um, I would like I, to say that I've, you know, I've worked in the council office since 2015, a year in the auditor's office. I remember a couple of times at the beginning of this approval where the former HR director did come to PAC, but um, it just kind of fell by the wayside. And I, I know that we have not been doing it at least the last three or four years. Yes. Okay. Um, well, I would propose that maybe um, we look at that. Um, and I don't know what, I've, I'm not on PAC, so <laughs> I haven't been on PAC. So I don't wanna just toss this over that direction, but um, at the same time, that that might be the right body for um, making some recommendations, perhaps based on what WIS says. Um, I did note that it says um, that part of the purpose is I, cutting down on training costs. So that could be, get that's sort of the beginnings of a metric if we were to look back. Anyway, there's a whole bit, bunch to talk about there that I don't, need to waste everyone's time with, but just wanted to throw that for consideration. Um, we are going to have, Kim and I are having a meeting tomorrow with Wes tomorrow morning. So I'm going to share this feedback with them if they have time to talk about this. This is not what our meeting's about, but if they have time to talk about this, I'll share this feedback and get their input and share with you guys. Good idea. Anything uh, further? Ms. Hawk, did you have a? Uh, yes, it's a reminder. It hasn't been that long ago that our prosecutor brought forward a request such as this uh, to hire at midpoint, and she was so well prepared. She had it lined out exactly at word, all of the documentation, not just what her thoughts or feelings were, but the documentation of why this person she wanted to hire at midpoint was qualified for that position. And so I think part of what we will be doing once we arrive at proper criteria is making sure that the people understand that are coming to request this, understand that they need to document what they are saying, not just mm -hmm. leaving it sort of vague, but, but very clear documentation so that we can make the proper decision. Thank you. Okay, well, this has been a good uh, productive discussion, I think. Is there anything uh, further from council? All right. And so uh, our, in terms of timeline, Ms. Rice, when, uh, when might we want to think about an updated resolution. What are you thinking? I might defer to Kim, but I'll tell you my thoughts. Um, again, I think that we could have some feedback from WIS before your next work session and could have a recommended draft for at least for additional conversation. Yeah, Not that okay. you'd be voting on it, but something for us to yeah, talk about yeah. if you like it. Okay. And I might suggest that if, uh, the PAC committee would like to review this. I mean, we could do that at the uh, July meeting, you know, just kind of tossing okay. that information around per Councillor Wilt's recommendation. So, Do we have any items for PAC in the hopper for July? No, not any at this request? time. Okay. Yes, Mr. Decker. I would be good with PAC adding that. One item of note I just want to make is, as we heard today from Mr. Malone, they were uh, in the process of using the first midpoint process to secure someone. 
lost someone to someone else intentionally their or their own um, current position. And then we're coming back to attract a new candidate under this midpoint process. I bring this up because I don't have to tell you all, you're watching the hiring numbers and the issues that we have with people, workforce, going into jobs, staying in jobs, et cetera. I think that should be really cognizant for all council members as we think about our county workforce and retaining workforce, attracting, et cetera. Okay. Very good. Well, I think we can uh, wrap up this discussion and we'll look forward to more information to come. Uh, and as well as an update from the, the meeting with WIST tomorrow, I think too will be good to have. Okay. Um, so that will bring us to item 10, uh, approval of minutes. Council, I move to approve the summary minutes for May 25th, 2021 work session as presented. Second. All right. Do we have any changes to the minutes? Any discussion about the minutes? No? Okay. Do we have any public comment on the minutes? All right. We'll do a roll call vote. On the motion to approve May 25th, 2021 work session minutes as presented. Councilor Deckard? Yes. Councilor Wilt? Yes. Councillor McKim? Yes. Councillor Hawk? Yes. Councillor Iverson? Yes. Councillor Spoonmore? Yes. Motion passed six to zero. And uh, that will wrap up item 10. So item 11, just a reminder, we do uh, continue to have a vacancy on the Women's Commission. Uh, and I see Mr. Iverson's hand. I believe Mr. Iverson is our appointment, council appointment to the Women's Commission. Uh, I actually wanted uh, to bring to the council's attention that the environmental commission believes it has a vacancy as well. Huh. Uh, and I uh, just wanted to uh, put that out there. So we have potentially two vacancies now. Okay. We'll, we'll verify that. Thanks for bringing that to our attention. I'm running people off on the different <laughs> boards that I'm on. So. <laughs> <laughs> We'll get these filled here soon. And just a, just a reminder to everybody, if you have good candidates or if there's anybody in the public uh, who's interested in these roles, uh, please contact the council office or the uh, visit the, the county website. There's um, applications there that you can fill out and submit, and we'd be happy uh, to review those applications for appointment. All right. Item 12 is our council comment period. Do we have any council members who'd like to make comment before... We adjourn. Mr. Deckard. Thank you very much. Counselors, I actually have two comments, but the first one I'll mention, uh, I'm pinch hitting for uh, Counselor Munson, who uh, is away. Uh, as you all know, this weekend was absolutely awful with Friday night, particularly into Saturday morning for torrential rain and flooding, flash flooding to be very specific in a lot of our communities and neighborhoods. And, and certainly there's a lot of folks going through, through this right now. Uh, there's uh, really two uh, kinds of community members. Those of us that were able to clean what we had up and move on and those that are really assessing what's going on with their business, et cetera. I had a very long and uh, helpful discussion with Allison Moore, who is our Monroe County Emergency uh, Management uh, Director and we talked about where we are currently in that state. I know that our commissioners are working very closely with uh, her towards uh, perfecting the uh, disaster declaration that we have th that is ongoing. And the state is also working on that as well as the Red Cross. But specifically, the thing I wanted to mention is for, and this will be coming out more than just in my comments, thankfully, but for those community members that have a business or a home that was affected in that flooding, they can go right now to the county website, www.co.monroe.in.us, and they'll see right there at the top of our red bar that says important news, they'll see Monroe County Storm and Flood Damage Assessment. And that will take them to a link that's maintained by 211 and they can begin to input in the damage that has happened to them. 
Now, a lot of people, they're, they're, this was traumatic and they, they don't want to think about it, but this is very, very important as those of us that have been through disasters before. Inputting that will add that total together, help us as a county to determine that total damage that we have both in businesses and in properties. And later on, this could help the state in determining if we would qualify for help through federal assistance. So this is very, very important. Obviously, this is going to be coming out more than just me. But again, go to www.co.monroe.in.us. For those that cannot get to the web because of obvious reasons due to flood damage, et cetera, they could call 211 and they should be able to walk them through that. There's much more coming on this. Last thing I just want to say on that is our first responders were out in force border to border in this county. And that includes city forces, that includes the district, it includes our folks out there in our, our, our cities and towns, and they were awesome. And I took a drive out and it was just amazing to a safe drive out. I didn't go into the to bad waters. It was amazing to see them doing all those things for families, businesses that were really not that was nobody wants what happened. Uh, so obviously we have a lot to work through and we think of those folks. The only other announcement that I was just going to make is um, Smithville is turning 175 years old and they're having a celebration this Saturday. I know this is in Marty's district and I don't want to take from her if she wants to say anything, but they're having a parade at one o'clock and a reception down at Redmond Hall. And I just think that's absolutely awesome. Smithville's one of our oldest communities and uh, very important to all of us. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Deckard, for those important announcements. Do we have any, uh, uh, Ms. Hawk, yes? Any uh, yes, isn't uh, our required attendance uh, for this Saturday, uh, State Board of Accounts, is that, that's this Saturday, correct? I think you might be right the yeah yes it's a state called meeting this saturday so i don't know whether we have uh if a group of us plan i mean i don't know what the plans are uh i would love for it to be where we didn't have to go in person and we could still uh participate for those of us who have many other things planned for the 26th, there's so much on our plates for the 26th. But, and, and our, will our staff be going? Yes, um, Margie and I are both going to be attending on Saturday. I will be uh, attending a uh, budget and finance class on Friday that the um, the LGF is putting on. So will you be doing that online? No, this is all in person. Is, is there an online option for any of it? I don't think there it was. No, there wasn't. I don't think so. I didn't, I didn't think I saw one either. I it's intend to go as driving. well. It's in Plainfield, right? Correct. Yes. I wasn't intending yeah, to go I'll, to. I'll be going. Yeah. Okay. Anything further, Ms. Hawk? I just that my heart goes out to all those people who are still trying to get their basements uh, dried out and uh, ripping up carpet and trying to figure out what they're going to do with damaged drywall. I mean, uh, you. It's everywhere. I don't know how I escaped it this this year. Uh, my daughter said, I've got it covered, Mom. I've already prayed about it. So uh, I'm grateful Teresa was here. Uh, and we had a great visit. We haven't seen your children for over two years. It was time for a visit. And of course, we had to have uh, this kind of a flood right in the middle of it. Uh, last time we had the tornado come through. So it's dangerous when Teresa comes to town, I'm telling you. Uh, but I've talked to many friends who are there still trying to, you know, figure out how they're going to get the carpet ripped up and out of, 
of areas where their bedroom is, where their family room is. And so, and they can't just leave it because then when you start getting mold and they'll do, and, and we've got people who've lost all their uh, frozen goods in their freezers and, uh, and we see, we hear the chainsaws going everywhere. I don't know whether they're going on in your neighborhood, but they've been going on. I can hear them cutting up the trees that came down. So uh, I'm just uh, glad that not, not that we didn't see more loss of lives. But when they say, if you see water, don't try to go through it. The sad part is a life was lost, it appears, uh, due to trying to go across flowing water. So this is Monroe County. It's a part of why we love living here. Uh, we have all these trees, et cetera, but it's also a part of the challenge. Okay. Any, thank you for your comments. Are there any further council comments? Okay. Well, that will uh, do it for this evening. Uh, we will uh, we'll be adjourned until our next meeting. Uh, which will be our regular session in July. Have a good evening, everyone.